Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm happy to share with you my uh, personal progress on understanding human uh, water interactions and dynamics, uh, especially with a focus on interdisciplinarity. So this is not about what I achieved in my research, but it's more about my personal um, yeah, thinking about interdisciplinarity. And as we have uh, gathered a lot of uh, disciplines here in this room, I think it might be of interest and I hope it will invoke some discussion at the end. So I will start um, with my focus on interdisciplinarity with an example from a case study in Benin about assessing future water availability. And I will move on to a German case study about managing flat risk on a change where I was engaged with stakeholders, so more a transdisciplinary uh, approach. And then uh, in a third case study from Tanzania, which is about visions of agricultural land use in Tanzania and how these visions shape future land use and water resources with more a collaborative um, approach. And then I just will highlight at the end, if I have time enough, to uh, just present the pluralistic water research concept, which I developed in my group with my professor and also my other colleagues, Adrian, who is also here in the room, which tries to acknowledge different ways of thinking and which tries to overcome the problems which we often find in interdisciplinarity, uh, especially between natural science and social science. So the name challenge in water supply. So there are three pillars uh, in this part. We have the physical part, so we have seasonality of surface water due to dry and rainy season. We have the difficult access of groundwater due to the aquifer of properties. So this is on the physical side, which we are most as hydrologists or from the geography and how is what we are looking for. But then uh, there's also the other pillar, socioeconomic part. So there are financial and technical burdens to access the water in the aquifer. Um, there are maintenance problems. And furthermore, there is a problem of water quality, which comes through the socioeconomic issues. And then at the third pillar, I just highlight here the institutional pillar. So how is the village organization, which also feeds back to the socioeconomic part. And then in Benin, like 10 years ago, there was this process of decentralization and how this process um, influenced water availability. And then also the missing inter uh, intersectoral communication. So these are the three pillars. And now my task uh, then was to, uh, to do a water balance. So I just started with the water availability and I was working with natural scientists together on well, metrologists. They provided the climate scenarios, downscale regional climate models. And then my colleague did a hydrological model um, with a hydrological response units. And she provided me with discharge data and groundwater recharge data. And I also had a colleague who was doing the groundwater um, modeling, and he provided me also with data. And then on the other side, uh, we had the water demand, so from agricultural households and industry. And uh, with this information gathered by a lot of anthropologists and economists, I created socioeconomic uh, um, uh, scenarios, water demand scenarios. And I put this together in uh, a model which is quite known, water uh, evalu evaluation and planning model, uh, shortly V, to balance. So just input and output and what stays in the system. And here is the main point I just used from the, um, from the anthropologist to live with the people who gathered all the data, how what water is socially constructed. I just took in the end liter per day. So in my model, only liter per day came in to, to cover everything what's happened on the social side. So I was totally aware of this lack. But um, to keep the balance running, I needed this information. And what my uh, analysis will show in the scenario analysis, I just brought two examples. Um, for a, We have a seasonal change, though so the, the left picture shows um, that we have for, for the second decade that we have an increase in water uh, or in unmet demand and that uh, the period where we have this unmet demand um, decreases. And uh, then on the other side, we can just show for uh, the difference between climate and demographic um, impact. And also there are my assumptions behind this uh, graph. And there we see that in this case, the demographic impact is um, stronger than the one coming from the climate. So what to do with these uh, examples or with these results? So I think first the model results support an understanding trends and direction of change. But I think what I have said, we have three pillars and we have this uncertainty and we only use the liter per day. We need 
to put this into context and also try to combine it with the qualitative data of the other scientists. And when we do this, in this combination, we uh, can contribute to sustainable water management um, by reducing the risk and by, because by identifying drivers of change and also the impact. Sure. Move on to the next one, more the transdisciplinary. I was working with practitioners um, in, in different uh, catchments in Germany, mostly with uh, reservoirs. And um, yeah, I just brought here a line what, what has been published from the 1990s up to uh, recently on water resources, which is the blue line and then on water resources and uncertainty, because uncertainty is a very important point. We just heard it in this morning. Um, and we see that, uh, well, shortly after this influential paper from Funchewitz and Ravitz about post-normal science, um, it increased the, the notion of uncertainty. And then another increase was, I think, with a, a third assessment report from the IPCC, when there was a lot of uh, discussion about the uncertainties behind the results. And then later in the 2010s, then even the, the term risk came more and more important together with uncertainty, so that there is a, a, a difference between uncertainty and risk. And in uh, my uh, PhD studies, I tried to can come up, and I was uh, using, um, uh, supported by Sterling's uh, uncertainty matrix, um, and I kind of put it into a triangle, that risk is on the top where we have high knowledge. We can define risk if we know about the probabilities and we know the possibilities. And here uncertainty comes in because we don't know the probabilities really well. We don't know all possibilities. So we have uh, uncertainty and ambiguity, and, and in many cases we also have ignorance. So we, we don't know that the risk even exists. And... Um, we use a lot of, me uh, of methods which are using um, to understand risk, but we do not look at um, uncertainty. And this, what I learned here from is uh, uncertainty is very important and how do practitioners cope with it and how we from the science can support um, the practitioners in understanding it. So what I learned from my practitioners is that they have specific tools and they apply it to specific behavior to uh, handle and cope with uncertainty. So first, we have the uncertainty bounds, which we also know from our hydrological models or from other models, where we say uh, in our, that there's a, a bunch of um, uncertainty bounds because we have so much uh, in our scenarios. And then we also can look for sensitivities and scenarios, which is more um, a bottom-up approach than this top-down approach. And my practitioner said, well, the uncertainty bounds is so large, we, I can't derive measures out from it. I look more for sensitivities and for scenarios that I can say, well, where do I have no regret measures? And um, I think the, the interplay between top-down and bottom-up and also what we heard uh, this morning, that uh, the Sendai framework is more top-down. Do we need this? Is this good? Uh, do we need bottom-up? I think we need both uh, because... Also, we see the interfaces were saying it's very important to have these interfaces, and this is, well, very important here, top-down and bottom-up interface. And what the practitioners also said, they use a risk-based approach. This is why um, I was also looking into more this risk-based approach. And what they also told is transparency, and what we saw in the previous talk, um, bringing people together in a room and talking, this is a lot of transparency, because we uh, learn about their... Uh, Kind of way of reasoning, and also expert consultation, so bringing experts from different parts. Then I just keep this short. This is kind of a qualitative system anal analysis, and um, we are looking um, here from different parts, and this comes from a participatory um, approach, just as the previous talk, and maybe we can look just shortly into... Uh, um, a, a small part from here, like uh, going to, uh, how to decide about reservoir discharge. And we have, it's not about the details, we have three different ways of reasoning how to um, discharge um, the reservoir and how much water has to be left. And um, every perspective is equal value and every perspective has a, has a good reason behind. And um, these different things come from different people and give and having brought them together, help them understand why they're using 
specific data or why they're using specific reasons to um, to call for this decision. So um, using such an approach uh, identifies the plurality of perspectives and enforces cross communication, in my opinion. And it also um, shows the interaction of formal and tacit knowledge and makes tacit knowledge explicit. I think we need this uh, more and more that we have a lot of um, tacit knowledge, especially from the practitioners, which should be made more explicit. And such a, um, an exercise can help uh, in doing that. And this is just a hypothesis. This kind of work may foster social or institutional organizational learning. So move on to the last part, the uh, Tanzania um, case study, more a collaborative approach. Here we have large-scale land use change and social ecological transformation. On the map you see in the yellow which change uh, savanna and uh, woodland was converted into agricultural area. So there's a large-scale land use change and people rely on the wetland ecosystem because it's providing water. But with more and more use of this uh, wetland area, the wetland integrity is taking at risk and also the water provision and therefore also um, the regions of the farmers who depend on the land. And so in our research here, it's a large, large project. We want to identify the linkage and feedbacks between the humans and the environment and how do they shape um, the current and future land use patterns and water resource uses. And here we also draw, we saw this uh, methods uh, in the morning also on focus group discussions and we went with the farmers into the fields, we did transact walks to kind of look uh, the fits and misfits, um, what they were talking and fits and misfits of our understanding and also the dynamics of um, impact on agricultural decisions from the externals and also understand more the boundaries and restrictions and limitations. And most important, it's uh, yeah, it's understanding the scope and willingness of human action. And what we see in this in different villages, we see there is no optimality, uh, optimality paradigm. Uh, what a lot of uh, models are, are aiming for to, to to go to one point, but what is that point? And this is very different. And I think we learned from the agent-based models this morning with the presentations. They tried to kind of capture this, but I think there is still room to go. And then uh, we also did stakeholder workshops and everything was based on the modeling, an um, ideological catchment model for my colleague. And um, with, with this, we, together we kind of looked at the plurality of perspectives and the different ways and visions people gave to the modeling and also with the key system variables they identified. And um, yeah, so I just come to my conclusion here. So. Collaborative modeling informs, contextualize, and co-shares results, and I think this is the most important part in uh, collaborative um, approaches, the co-sharing. So I just keep this here uh, to be on time. So my re concluding uh, remarks are for the interdisciplinarity. So a plus is to acknowledge the system complexity, but you have to truncate um, information, which makes feel other um, scientists maybe uncomfortable. Uh, then we have the transdisciplinarity, so we can close the usability gap by using top-down and bottom-up approaches, but we have to cope with different questions, because practitioners have different questions as scientists. Third, the collaborative approach, I think the most important uh, positive point is to create ownership, but I think the challenge we are facing is the transfer of qualitative data into quantitative models. And um, I haven't said about the pluralistic water research concept, but this tries to overcome truncated information, but it's time to consume an acceptance is now. So this is like the person on the left side seeing a six and the person on the other side seeing a nine. And well, from each position, the, the person is right. And is it going about right or about the perspective and trying to integrate this? And this leads me just to the last question, so or the last point. Risk and resilience need this transdisciplinary and collaborative approaches to understand the if and also the when it happens to kind of conflict. So thank you for your <laughs> Thanks, Frida, for three nice case studies. It's really yeah. interesting with the participatory modeling. You're also having, I mean, working with this participatory model in Bangladesh Delta. So maybe um, some few questions before we go for lunch.
Or you can continue the discussion. Well, maybe you can well. challenge me by saying, well, um, <laughs> it does not work at all. or <laughs> Because uh, if it's just my personal um, okay. perspective. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you can come back to the slide of the realistic water. Research, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, uh, this model just uh, tries to, to set the human and the watcher into a so-called human hydrosphere. We just call this place, you could call it whatever you like. And this is the place where these two parts um, interact. And we, we think of um, the feedback processes. And for, for us, it's most important, uh, not the source or the user itself, but what happens in these arrows. So what is giving back? And this is kind of a, a round circle. And we, we are aware that the sources and the uses are situated in boundary conditions, in the physical boundary conditions and the human boundary conditions. And they influence the users and the sources. And um, yeah, when coming from the natural science, I think we, uh, we know a lot about the physical boundary conditions and we, can, we know a lot about the sources. But we also want to engage more the, the social science um, scientists. And, um, that they can kind of share the information. And so, so it should be a reciprocal um, approach and a stepwise approach in understanding this feedback. So it's always interrupted by what's now changing with the boundary conditions after this feedback round. And we put it in space and time and also the sensitivity. I think this is crucial for this group here because I think this shows the risk and resilience. So the sensitive parameters in, in the system where change happens. Okay, thanks, Peter. Then um, 